Terrence McKenna. I heard a click Hello. in it. Terrence! Welcome to Gender how are you? <laughs> Great, how are you doing? You don't know how excited we are to have you. <laughs> well, you don't know how exciting it is to be had by you, considering <laughs> that uh, this circuit is dependent on the rain and could at any moment fail. <laughs> and which is the reason why we weren't able to raise you last week, because uh, you're on a radio telephone, is that it? It's more complicated than that. I have, I'm running through my computer, which works by spread spectrum radio to go 30 miles through the air, and the telephone is piggybacking on the internet connection. Do you live in Mars? Yeah, we're, where, where are you calling us from, or where are we calling you? I'm speaking to you from the slopes of the world's largest volcano on the big island of Hawaii. Really? Wow. wow. Now, that must be beautiful, beautiful area. That must be... Oh, no, w- it's beautiful. It's a little gloomy and rainy today, but yes, we're in deep forest with lots of tree ferns, and uh, it's wonderful. Is that a risky uh, if place? You could speak up a little bit. That okay, how can you can we, can you give? Uh, how's we're, yeah? We're we're struggling a little bit with the phone link, Terrence. We'll do our best. Okay. Okay. Well, if it gets too flaky, don't feel bad about uh, throwing me out. I understand the problems you may be having. All right. Well, while we have you, let's talk about um, your work. Now, you've written a number of books. Um, I'm not familiar with your books. Could you tell us, you know, what you've been doing uh, from the standpoint of altered states of consciousness um, and well, whatever I've hallucinogens? Written, uh, several books: uh, Food of the Gods, Invisible Landscape, True Hallucinations, and the theme of all these books has been uh, consciousness-altering plants uh, used by Aboriginal people and the uh, evolution of the human consciousness under the influence of these kinds of plants. So basically I'm a scholar and an advocate of the psychedelic experience as mediated by uh, various plants that occur in ecosystems all over the world. You, you bring up an interesting point, which is that um, these kinds of experiences have been used in the past by other cultures, but are, are currently outlawed by the particular culture we live in. Um, yes, well, the particular culture we live in has made alcohol and tobacco two of the most destructive drugs ever discovered by man into their drugs of choice, and then has proceeded to demonize, legislate against, and stigmatize uh, all the other botanical options and uh, uh, since the rise of modern science, pharmacological options that science has provided. So, yes, our culture is particularly neurotic around this issue of drugs. Okay, let's talk about um, and do whatever education we can. We've got about uh, 20 minutes now to talk about hallucinogens, um, naturally occurring hallucinogens, I presume we're talking about like psilocybin mushrooms, and I don't know what else, maybe peyote or whatever else. Can you yes, give us... Psilocybin mushrooms, peyote, these are excellent classic examples. Okay, I want to talk about the benefits and the drawbacks and the cautions um, in using these drugs. I want to do whatever good education we can do here. So let's talk about what. It, why would anybody want to take, um, say, let's talk about mushrooms since that's one that I'm familiar with. Let's, why would anybody want to take hallucinogenic mushrooms? Well, in the original Aboriginal cultures that characterized uh, uh, humans a long time ago, uh, it's well understood that psilocybin increases at low doses visual acuity. So it makes for better hunting skills. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that that is going to be a very important thing for a culture. At higher doses, uh, these things uh, cause arousal, which in primates like ourselves often means sexual arousal. And then at still higher doses than that, uh, you get very complex uh, states of hallucination, very complicated transformations of mental processes that I think probably were the earliest form of media entertainment. Ah. Uh, people found their minds to be an unexplored domain of nature 
that opened up to them under the influence of, for example, mushroom. What, what do you mean that that my mind would open up to me, or that a person's mind would open up under the influence of mushrooms? Can you can you tell us a little bit more? Give us more of a sense of what that's all about. Some example of that, maybe. Well, ordinary consciousness is pretty much characterized by mundane concerns and uh, an ongoing analysis of the immediate. Uh, perceived environment. Most people's experience with altered states of consciousness begins with dreams, and indeed, uh, psychedelic states have been compared to waking dreams. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Cool. So, um, so where were we going with that? So, um, he was going to tell us. So it's kind of like it's kind of like waking dreams, then. And yeah, why? Where okay. a waking dream is what? W- w- that was the comparison? No, I don't know what a waking dream is. Oh. Do you understand what the question is? <laughs> well, a waking dream is when you think you're dreaming, but you're awake. Uh, in other words, in normal physiological functioning, dreaming happens when we're uh, in deep sleep. But the psychedelics seem to recreate the chemistry of the dreaming brain without pushing aside the chemistry of the waking brain. And so there is a simultaneous experience of being in the world of ordinary perception, but that shares the mental space uh, with a a kind of dreamlike transformation of objects, ideas, uh, and feelings. So in other words, um, in this state, you would experience yourself as being awake, being in the world, but at the same time, you would um, you would actually experience, um, say, objects or things that you see um, doing things that in reality they aren't doing or that other people would say they aren't doing. Well, that's one possibility. Uh, a more dramatic possibility is that you would ex- experience objects or feelings or perceptions for which ordinary experience offers no analogies. Uh, and in a sense, that causes, uh, that acts as a stimulation to the imagination. You could almost argue that one of the things pushing the early evolution of language was people's efforts to explain to each other the completely non-ordinary experiences and perceptions that they were having in these uh, in these plant-induced uh, mental states. And that's isn't that what Alice's Adventures in Wonderland are are about? In, in, to well, some extent? it's perhaps not without implication that just a few hundred yards from where Lewis Carroll wrote uh, Alice in Wonderland, we find uh, several species of psilocybin mushrooms growing really? wow. near Trinity College in England. I love it. Now, I've, I've um, in, in the limited experimentation that I've done with psilocybin and, and, and other hallucinogens, I notice a significant difference in my sense of time. I notice that time seems to operate differently. That um, I become much more, f- much more focused or present in the moment. Um, is that is that something that's a consistent that's common, effect? Or, yeah. Is that common? And and is there any way you can describe yeah, that better? That's maybe one of the very common motifs of the psychedelic experience. Uh, you see, what we call time is really the physiological time of the body, the unfolding of of uh, digestion, mentation, and metabolism. And these things are altered, or the perception of them is altered under the influence of psychedelics. And, and even the critics of psychedelics have agreed that these things do offer parallels to the classic states of mystical transcendence and enlightenment that many world religions talk about. It's simply that the critics of psychedelics choose to claim that these experiences are somehow illegitimate if obtained by taking a plant, but are somehow sanctioned if achieved through 
prayer, fasting, flagellation, and self-abandonment in the wilderness. I, I think when we transcend all these cultural judgments, what we have to admit is that uh, the chemistry of the brain is the basis of consciousness. It can be altered by uh, ordeal, trauma, uh, dietary shifts, but the easiest and most effective way of altering consciousness without doing it any great harm is uh, to chemically intervene at the level of the synapse, and this is easily done uh, with these uh, psychoactive plants that we're discussing. All right, let's talk about, um, again, going back a little bit to the why of one would want to do this. I know that some people advocate that um, by um, entering an altered state of consciousness or transitioning through them or spending time in them, that one can um, one can alter one's perspective on one's own brain's functioning or on one's life and achieve some power um, that is not normally accessible so that one can actually... Um, achieve some benefit in the real world from spending some amount of time in an altered state of consciousness. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yes. Well, you see, there's a tension between culture, which is a kind of shared hallucination sanctioned through a shared language and a shared history, and uh, the individual who always, I think, in all times and places has felt uh, somewhat uh, confined by cultural definition. Mm. And whether we approve or disapprove of psychedelic experiences, I think we can all agree that what they do is they dissolve boundaries. They dissolve boundaries between the conscious and unconscious mind, between oneself and the people around them, between past and future, and they dissolve cultural boundaries and return us to, I guess, what I would call the authentic legacy of the human body, unmodified by cultural assumptions. So the politics of psychedelics is very complicated because every culture is interested in uh, maintaining its notion of boundaries and not having those boundaries breached or even closely examined and discussed. And psychedelics just simply expose those boundaries for exactly what they are, which is provisional uh, uh, boundaries put in place by culture and language, not God sent, not uh, eternally part of the human experience, but very fleeting and transitory. So all cultures have been uh, uneasy around psychedelic substances, and some have chosen to prohibit them, and others, I think, have chosen the path of actually teaching people how to understand and navigate these spaces uh, rather than forbidding them or or stigmatizing them. Which is the position that, that I take in, on this program, and, and that's what we're trying to do here, is do a little bit of education around this. Do you think, then, that um, the psychedelics allow us to um, to sort of get outside of the limitations to our thought that are imposed by the fact that we think in our language and our thinking is constrained by the structure of our language? Uh, yes, our thinking is constrained by the structure of our language, but it's even more constrained by uh, our cultural values and uh, historical momentum and our mundane expectations. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, a psychedelic experience is a vacation from uh, the very confining dimension that we define as cultural uh, um, adaptation. Interesting. Though that can be troubling sometimes, can it not? I mean, I've certainly taken psychedelic drugs and had very, very scary experiences with them. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. It can be, what did you say? 
I said, in my experience, that can sometimes be a scary and upsetting thing. I mean... Oh, absolutely, it can, yes. I mean, two people having uh, taking exactly the same psychedelic substance, one may experience ecstasy and another may experience extreme uh, discomfort or fear. And really, this has to do with personality types. Some people want to transcend the limitations of culture, and some people believe that beyond the frontier of culture there is madness and darkness, and when they find themselves in those places, uh, they completely come apart. I, I think of taking these psychedelic substances as a very demanding quasi-athletic undertaking, like ocean kayaking or rock climbing. And you want to know your tools, you want to know the territory, you want to be confident of your partners. And, uh, you know, some people enjoy these kinds of thrilling forays into unusual dimensions. And other people are perfectly comfortable putting their feet up and uh, watching daytime TV. Uh, so it's, it's not for everyone. On the other hand, no one should seek to deny other people the opportunity of having this experience. Just if a quick, quick, I'm sorry. parallels to our attitudes toward various expressions of our sexuality, you know, some people would rather not hear about uh, uh, the varieties of the sexual experience, and for other people, they find that challenging and interesting. Uh, so it's just part of humanness, uh, a part of humanness that our particular culture, rooted in uh, Calvinism and uh, European empiricism and values like that, has uh, been very nervous about, especially since the news of many of these plants has come to us from Aboriginal cultures that we have tended to devalue, exterminate, exterminate and uh, yeah. consider inferior. Quick question. Um, you were speaking of using psychedelics for the purpose of spiritual enlightenment, and I certainly agree to that, but most of the cultures where this is done, there is a context, there is a language, there is guidance. Uh, when people take peyote, they expect to see visions, but there's a range of visions within the American Indians that they expect to see. It's, it's not just, they're, they're not doing it blindly. They're not doing it totally off the top of their head. Am I making any sense? And your question is? My question yes. is, I, I fear the danger of not taking it seriously. I mean, taking it for fun, yeah, but you're dealing with very powerful substances, and you're dealing with your own mind, which you find out things about. So, uh, well, yes, I am definitely not an advocate, and in fact, I abhor the concept of recreational drugs. I think this is an effort on the part of our culture to trivialize the experience. Uh, people who think taking drugs is easy haven't taken the drugs I'm talking about, and you're quite right. You need a context. First of all, uh, you need to control uh, the immediate environment around you. It should be comfortable, it should be reassuring, it should be familiar, and then you need to have a certain sophistication about your own psyche and uh, uh, what might lie within. You know, it's only been within the confines of the 20th century that Freud and Jung introduced Western people uh, to the idea that there were uh, repressed and uh, uh, atavistic portions of the human psyche. So I, and you're right that our culture gives us no context for this, so I urge people who are contemplating this to read a little anthropology, read some of the literature that has been produced about the ways tribal people approach these things, the techniques that they have evolved, and then to proceed with great caution and a real sense that you may not be leaving your living room, but in no sense of the word can you treat these dimensions uh, as, uh, as trivial or as mere entertainment, because they will uh, challenge the, the limits of your ability to understand and to feel 
and to integrate, this is what makes it so exciting and for some people so perilous. Have you read the Carlos Castaneda books and what do you think about them? Uh, I have read them. I think the first one was brilliant. I believe after that he succumbed to pressure from his publisher and his agent and ceased to write uh, reportage about psychedelic plant experiences and instead substituted a kind of new age spiritualism and mumbo jumbo. Uh, but the first book, The Teachings of Don Juan, I can hardly think of a better introduction to the world we're talking about than that book. Cool. I've heard people come... Unless it would be one of my books. (laughs) There you go. And and we'll give you time to to tell us about that. Because I had heard that people were saying that his books were made up, there was no source of truth, and I loved especially the first book, and I would hate to think that he somehow made them up. I can't Mm. imagine that he made them up. Well, I don't know what making them up means. I mean, did Proust make up a la recherche du temps perdu? (laughs) He recalled, he adumbrated, he embellished. Uh, I think what Castaneda was not completely straightforward about in his later books was most of these altered states cannot be achieved any way other than through the use of psychoactive plants. Yoga is a different thing. Meditation is a different thing. Uh, and to try to trade one for the other is is really to confuse the issue. Terence, you, you mentioned that when one takes psychedelics, that things can come up from the subconscious. Um, and um, the question I have then is, that can, can the experience then be useful for sort of peeling away at those lasers, for accessing things that are that maybe one has difficulty gaining access to normally. Well, yes, uh, a lot of psychotherapists have made this same connection, and uh, at low and moderate doses, many of these psychedelics uh, reveal uh, repressed memories, childhood trauma, or confer insight on one's personal dilemmas and so forth. Uh, That's very interesting to clinicians. I'm more interested in what's going on at slightly higher uh, dosages where you enter what I would call a transpersonal realm. In other words, a realm not defined by your own life history and experience. And that is the realm that has parallels to shamanism and the mystical experience and spiritual quest as uh, described and sought after by some of the world's great religion. What about psychedelic drugs that aren't natural? Like what about LSD, for example? Do you mean do I think they're legitimate and so forth? Right, I mean... Uh, they raise issues and problems that we don't have with the plants Some of them are effective, uh, but, you know, when you're looking at a drug that's been used for thousands of years by Aboriginal people, you already have medical data in hand. The fact that these people are using this substance means it does not cause blindness, birth defects, uh, abortions, the uh, Parkinson's symptom uh, syndrome. Uh, if you have a drug, a white powder drug, straight out of the laboratory, you really don't know what you have on your hand. You may have a perfectly benign and effective substance, or you may have something that, uh, under the influence of bad uh, chemistry or greedy marketeers, has been badly synthesized or combined with uh, other materials that make it dangerous or ineffective. So, in principle, uh, I think there are many interesting synthetic psychedelic substances, but in practice, I think uh, the richer and safer experiences are delivered by the 
psychoactive plants with a long history of human usage. Let's talk about safety now. We have just a few minutes left, Terrence, and um, since we've uh, talked about some of the interesting um, sides of, of using hallucinogens, let's talk about safety and hallucinogens. Can you give us a rundown of, of uh, the important cautions that people should be aware of um, and maybe repeating the ones that you've already given us? Well, as I said, I mean, I, I think if you're going to experiment with these things, you should inform uh, your nearest and dearest of what you intend. You should inform yourself of the uh, spectrum of activity that you might expect. Uh, you should arrange to do this in a situation that is not likely to produce anxiety or sudden surprises. I don't think crowded social environments full of loud music and complex social signals are the uh, best environment to do these things. I think people should do these things conscientiously and uh, in an informed uh, uh, manner. So very carefully is what you're saying. Very carefully. Yes, and you, every substance or every plant that you can imagine has a vast body of literature, scientific, medical, anecdotal literature that can prepare you for whatever the experience is going to be. The Internet is a, a tremendous resource uh, in this way, and hundreds and hundreds of people uh, have described and their uh, reactions to these things under optimum conditions and under terrible conditions. And by uh, looking into it and informing yourself, I mean, you, you would not go ocean kayaking without a thorough knowledge of the weather patterns, the behavior of the sea, your own uh, ability with the boat, and so on. Uh, in other words, just good sense and caution. And I dare say, if all this is in place, the rewards from these things can be tremendous. I, I believe that to go from birth to the grave without ever having a psychedelic experience is for a person to make that same journey without ever having a sexual experience. These things are part of the legacy of what it is uh, to be a human being. The uh, Aboriginal societies have used them for millennia. They are part of the natural environment of the earth. And uh, I'm confident that the exploration of the last and greatest frontier, which is the human mind, cannot really proceed to any depth without availing itself of these things. Fascinating. Terrence, um, where can people get um, information about your books? And uh, um, do you want to, oh, well, or, or uh, if you want to give out books, any contact? Uh, are sold uh, at major bookstores throughout uh, the world. People can visit my website by simply uh, searching my name. Terrence has one R, let me point out. <laughs> T E R E N C E. Uh, I do have a new book out with. Uh, uh, the British biologist Rupert Sheldrake and the mathematician Ralph Abraham, a book called uh, The Evolutionary Mind, and uh, they can order that from their local bookstore. Is that and a good? They will find when they look into this that there there is a very rich literature discussing these matters uh, at the level of anthropology, pharmacology, clinical medicine experientially, uh, their impact on art, uh, on culture, on politics. Uh, this is a very big part of who we are, and it's a tragedy that the timidity of science and political institutions has not only stigmatized these things, but made them illegal, and by doing so has distorted and ruined a lot of people's lives, not people who were ordinarily part of a criminal enterprise or class, but people who were simply sincerely interested in understanding themselves. That's okay. On that note, Terence, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm so happy the phone cooperated. And, uh, yes. Uh, thanks for having me on. All right. Take, take care, care, and I look forward to talking with you again. All right. Nice talking with you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Now. Bye.